Greetings from Utah Opera's production studio building. I'm Toby Tolican, Vice President of Symphony Artistic Planning. We'll be streaming on demand this program and we're so glad to have our conductor Asher Fish making his debut with us, music of Richard Strauss and Felix Mendelssohn. Welcome Asher, thank you for traveling all this way. My gosh, Thank from you. Europe, it's, <laughs> it's never easy and it's certainly not easy in this era. But it was very good to travel for work. <laughs> oh, that's great. But you are so busy. And of course, you are giving the Bayerische Staatsoper wonderful advertising. Yeah, I have two of them. I've been working in, in Munich at the opera and in Bologna at the opera, and I have two masks. But ah, for today, ah, I picked the Bayerische that's Staatsoper. That's very nice. <laughs> I hope you get some, you know, royalties. Royalties back Let's from see. them. Okay. <laughs> Uh, let's talk first of maybe about the Mendelssohn, if you don't That's mind. What's, what I find interesting is, thanks to the publishers, they make it sound like his third, but it's actually the last one he wrote, yet he gets inspired by this first trip of many to England, to Scotland the only time, but he waits, I think, almost 11 or 12 years to complete it. It's, it's a fascinating story. It, it's, Adventurous it's, guy. It's not the, yeah, well, it's not the only uh, such case in the history of music mm -hmm. of somebody getting an impression earlier on and then going back to finish, to finish the work. Mm -hmm. But it's true. In 1829, he went to visit Scotland. Only which 20 was, years old, yeah. Which was a big, uh, much bigger than my travels yesterday yes. all the way to Salt Lake City. Yes, yeah, stagecoach and, still in <laughs> and that he era. Was, and he was very impressed with what he saw and he started to scribble down some notes mm -hmm. and wrote the Hebrides Overture, which is also Scottish, yeah. uh, Scott influenced. And then he left it alone. And I think it's, if, if you know the symphonies, it's quite obvious that this was the last one because it is the most, the most progressive, the mm -hmm. most advanced, the mm -hmm. most harmonically, the structure, the fact that uh, he wanted all the movements to be played without intermission, without a break between yeah. the movements. And uh, the ending, which is very strange, and we can say a few words about yeah. the ending, um, it's definitely a late, a, a mature Mendelssohn. Yeah. And even the beginning is interesting. He delays the use of the violins, he uses the middle register, winds uh, I and I think violas. that this is genius. How can you create a Scottish sound mm. with German music? It's, <laughs> it would be difficult, but just by choosing the mix of the viola with the softer winds, he gets that and all you have to hear is the first bar yeah. and it really trans transcends you into this at, at least i would say romantic nordic cool landscape yeah. you know that you're there and that's only by the by, by means of orchestration it's quite genius yeah. and apparently he is inspired to go to scotland because of sir walter scott's novels but also he goes to this holy rood you know, chapel where Mary Queen of Scots Mary, is, yeah. was crowned and it has no roof anymore and the altar is broken and apparently this is where he writes down the first 16 bars yes. of and the symphony and then he holds it for 12 years. But this is the essence of romanticism. Mm -hmm. I mean, they all read Goethe and were very inspired by the trips to Italy. And for them, I, I think for Mendelssohn, it was probably for the better that there was no roof and it was all overgrown with moth because yeah. that gave him this inspiration. But mm -hmm. he wrote two, two symphonies based on, on his impressions of other countries. And of course, the Germans in those days and until today, uh, Italy is sunshine and uh, beaches and Scotland is cold and dreary <laughs> and history of wars yeah. and whiskey and, <laughs> and and that's what he and that's really the essence of romanticism that's why i like these symphonies so much it's yeah. a in, very innocent uh but but a true romantic spirit and it's one of the first really romantic works mm -hmm. uh, uh, pure purely romantic and apparently when he conducted the premiere he did not let out any kind of program but i think it was schumann that saw, thought he heard was hearing folk songs but yet it's not, they're not any folk songs. He made a Scottish sound somehow. This, this is the genius of, of Mendelssohn. A lot of, even Strauss and the Metamorphose and the other work on our program, mm -hmm. um, they don't like to disclose the, the, the plan. They want the audience to be able to find it or not find it. And if they don't find it, it's also okay. Yeah. Uh, but in the case of the Scottish, I think that uh, it's, 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 people have always identified it with the Scottish history and Scottish landscapes. Yeah. And, and the fast movement, which is the second movement, right? Uh, yeah. The, the adagio comes later. Yeah. Is, 
has that snap too, right? The Scottish snap with the clarinet. The clarinet solo crazy, yeah. and this, the, the, the speed of, this is like a, a dance, I would say, mm -hmm. probably. Uh, the third is a wake, is a, is a, and, the, and the, the last one is Allegro Guerriero, a, 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 a combat Allegro, yeah. uh, which is relating to the bloody history of Scotland, of Scotland yeah. and all yeah. the wars and the fights. And, yeah. uh, and then the end is, as I said... Yeah, it's uh, not the fast ending that you might no, expect, like an Italian symphony of Mendelssohn. No, no it's, it's, uh, it's actually so problematic that Otto Klemper composed... He refused to conduct the symphony with this ending. He's a famous conductor of the bygone era. And he, con he composed his own ending and recorded it. And I, I actually know. listened to this recording. Uh, and the materials come from, did he make it a slick, cyclic he, thing? Or? Yes, he, he took some of the material from the beginning uh, and from the end of the movement wow. and just gave it a slow ending. And he said that he hated the ending so much. And I can see as a conductor, I see the, the problem of, uh, of making this ending work. It's mm. slowish, it's in major, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a quotation of a hymn that Mendelssohn wrote about Mary, Queen of Scots. So, so it, 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 it has a reason, but it's problematic. And I thought, I over the years struggled with it a little bit, and I think that I, I found a way to deal with it. And ah. it has worked for me recently. Ooh, we'll and find out. We'll find That's out. That's why you must <laughs> yeah. stream and uh, on demand for over a month. Yeah. Yeah, great. And you won't tell us the secret then, because then we'll have to watch. And they'll give it away, right? Um, the Strauss Metamorphosen. So we have, we have Mendelssohn toward the end of his much too short life, very much like, like Mozart dying way too young, only at 38, Mozart at 35, only six months after his favorite s sister, Fanny Mendelssohn, also gifted yeah. pianist and composer, passes. And apparently, if Wikipedia is correct, the whole family, including the parents, these, they all had strokes. I, it, there must have been no high blood pressure medicine or something, sadly. This, it's I don't know, strange. maybe the Jewish origins. Of or the maybe it's just they we carried it. Didn't we think that Mendelssohn <laughs> overworked himself or something? Could that be He possible? must have overworked himself because he, he was yeah. very prolific. He wrote a lot. Uh, but I don't know. This yeah. is, you would have to ask a historian about that. But, but, but Strauss is at, in his 80s, toward the end of his life, and he comes up with this piece for 23 different string parts, 23 solo strings, metamorphosen. You mentioned Goethe before. Apparently, Strauss was reading Goethe, and this metamorphosis title is in Goethe's last two poems. That's one of the explanations. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and what about the Beethoven Eroica reference? Do you believe that? Well, so I, uh, look, if I, if I have to explain it in a nutshell, please. I, d I generally do not subscribe to the idea of connecting almost every piece of music to a composer's personal life at mm -hmm. the time of composition. Mm -hmm. This is true sometimes in history, but it's really not the rule. It's a very romantic way of looking at our beloved composers. But now there's a trend to actually write new biographies that don't beautify lives ah. of uh, Beethoven and, and Brahms and people who suffered and had really tough, tough lives. And you cannot explain Schubert's great symphony and the mm -hmm. joy that it brings if you look at his life at the time. At the same time, you cannot explain Mahler's 10th symphony where everybody says he was so sick and Gropius said had an affair with his wife and he was dying, but we have a letter where he's writing how wonderful the marmalade was that he had for breakfast that day. <laughs> and this was while he was composing. Here so I, maybe Tchaikovsky, a pathetic is true, but I, I don't really... But this is one case where we, we can really not separate uh, historical events and the composition. So Strauss starts composing this piece one day after the destruction of the Vienna Opera House. Uh, and That's and where we, his life was and his father's life, right? His life between this Opera House and the Munich Opera House, which was also destroyed. Um, and Strauss was a, a, he was a broken man. This is definitely the, the quotation of the funeral march from uh, Beethoven's Eroica is definitely not a joke, as he did in so many other works mm -hmm. with quotations, yeah. because it is the end of an era. It's the end, and we don't really know what, and he never told us what he was mourning. He, he writes, when he has the, the quotation at the end, on the last page of the piece, he writes, in memoriam. Mm -hmm. 
And this can be Beethoven, it can be Napoleon, it can be German Reich. It can be, for me, it is classical music and culture. So uh, Strauss was the last stronghold of Romanticism. And he, as many other composers, composers who get to be very old, they bemoan, uh, like Verdi in, in Italy, when he stopped composing after Aida because he was so depressed about what was going on musically around him and Wagner's influence. Mm. So Strauss sees the destruction of his beloved way of writing music. And in a way, and this I only thought about this now when I uh, was thinking about our conversation, without intending it to be, we are, with this program, we're actually opening Romanticism and we're closing it. Okay, that's very true. Uh, Mendelssohn symphonies are really the beginning of pure Romanticism. Yes, Schubert and Beethoven, but this is the Mendelssohn-Schumann symphonies, that's where it all began. Uh, and I think that the Metamorphosen is probably the last... Yes, there were some two, three other works that he composed after, but one of the last romantic works. After that, that was it. That's the end of tonality. Mm. Tonality finished its life in the old form. Of course, there were new, uh, uh, there were new interpretations of tonality, but in the old form, this was it. And I think it's one of the only, and that's why everybody admires this piece so much, because it's one of the only totally sincere works of Strauss. I'm, sh I'm sure there are hidden jokes in it, which because he always quoted himself, he took mm. very happy tunes and turned them into slow, very somber situations. He, he was great at that, and I'm sure that there are some private jokes inside. But it's a, it's a very genuinely uh, sincere, sad, Mm -hmm. peace and it's the end of something and you can see this broken man after his whole cu cultural background collapsed on him two opera houses lying in ruins and um, and he composes this piece and it's 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 fantastic and it's difficult to understand the piece harmonically but actually it's it's quite simple because it's all built on on trides on on basic Harmonic structures, just the way that he puts them together makes it sound so unfamiliar and so new and so uh, uh, strange to our ears. But for me, this is, it, it, it's quite evident because at the end of his life, he, he sort of, he tried to formulate a new harmonic language, which would still be connected to the old traditional harmony. Mm -hmm. And he managed in Capriccio, the last opera, and in, in his other works, including the Metamorphosen. Mm -hmm. There's 23 different individual string parts, and that's fascinating by itself, but how, and maybe you're saying, yes, that's what we have to do this week, is figure out how to balance that. But, um, and I don't want to scare you, but we never played the piece before. That's very good. I always like when an yeah. orchestra has not played the piece, it, because... The, uh, Bravano Hall has heard the notes. Back in the 1980s, the visiting orchestra was Cleveland with Dochiani. But that's the only time those notes have been played in the hall. So I find that kind of exciting, too. Uh, now it's even more exciting yeah, for me. Yeah. Um, it, it's so well written. Hmm. You know that Strauss was He's one of the great of composers, yeah. uh, 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 orchestrators of all time. Hmm. And he knew how to orchestrate for a huge orchestra. And he knew how to use unusual instruments. But he also knew very well how to write to string instruments and the balance and it, in the in history of, of of the piece many con conductors from the middle of the 20th century used to beef up the string section they thought it was not enough Karajan and others mm. but it's not necessary because uh, 23 committed and uh, uh, enthusiastic players can create a huge gamut of sound and a, a huge dynamic diapason and it's all it's possible yeah Great. Can I ask you a little bit about your orchestra in Australia, where you've been for quite some time? And, and we were talking before, when, when I was flying on Delta very often back east or, or th to the rest of the U.S. or beyond, you, your live performance recordings of the four Brahms symphonies with your West Australian Orchestra were on the um, available list 
of all the classical stuff. And I'm sure I'm, sadly, I'm probably the only one in the plane not watching a movie. But I found them not only structurally exciting, but v viscerally exciting. And I think live performance, even if you have to do some, some, some edits, is still so cool in, in the recording world. So bravo to you. And, and I was trying to give you credit for Thank getting you. the Mondelta, but you said you didn't do it. No, it was the ABC <laughs> which recorded us. Which is like uh, the BBC of Australia. ABC right? is the um, Australian Broadcasting Company and they produce, they have a record label and they produce and they uh, distribute the works. Uh, did you do them all in one season? Did you do we all We did four them Brahms all in, in two weeks. We did oh a Brahms gosh. festival. That I think it's Superman came. He played the violin concerto. Garrick Olson came and played the two piano concerti, and uh, Amanda Zuckerman and Pinky, uh, did the Pinky's double. wife, they did the double. So we had a symphony and a concerto every night, and we did this over wow, two fantastic. weeks, two weekends. Wow. And I believe in cycle. I, I believe that if you play all four together, each one benefits from having played the other one recently. Yeah. I'm redoing now a, a Beethoven cycle for his birthday in Italy. And I see how from each symphony the orchestra grows and I have to work less, rehearse less, say less, and the symphonies get better because wow. if you play two and three and four and then you come to the fifth, it's a different story than if you just come to the fifth out of nowhere. Yeah. Uh, no, Perth is great, but it has the problem of, I think maybe Salt Lake City would have a little bit of that in this remoteness, but not compared to Perth. Yeah. Because Perth your flights from Milan to here were probably still not as long as wherever to, uh, no, to no, Perth, no, right? No, of course not. <laughs> I go Singapore usually, the Munich, Singapore, Perth. Uh -huh. But the problem is that the world does not know enough on the high level of music making in Australia. But, uh, but I heard it. You heard it. And I believe and it. And we recorded yeah. Tristan and Isolde recently and it, we, we received some international prizes. And everybody's so surprised. Oh my God, it's an Australian <laughs> orchestra playing. Yeah. But my orchestra, they're, they, they're a great mix of American professionalism and British, uh, uh, British efficiency in music making, mm -hmm. uh, sight reading, etc. And I just love the mix. And it feels a little bit like the, the, the atmosphere is a little bit like the West Coast, I work, where I worked in Seattle and in Los mm -hmm. Angeles. Yeah. It's similar. So it's not so rigid as it is in Europe. And, uh, it, but at the same time, it's, it's great, great music making. Mm. Uh, but it's remote. So the only way we can get to the rest of the world is through Delta uh, yeah. entertainment programs. And, and, and having you there for a long time on, on, the, yeah. on the docket. Yeah. That, that was really great. Bravo. I think we're really looking forward to the week like crazy. And, well, so am uh, I. It's and, a great program. thank you for the, both pieces. Yeah. It's a great program, and um, I, I've never rehearsed with a mask on. I hope that this is not going to be. And neither, issue. neither have they, except <laughs> since September they have been. Yeah. Yes. No, it'll be fine. They they listen very well, and they love to rehearse, and okay. so, I, so we'll we we'll look forward to it. Thank you again. Thank you very much, bro.